All power to the people. Greetings. Um, you're tuned to Freedom is a Constant Struggle, uh, filmed by Angola Free News. And my guests today are Dilcia Pagan of Puerto Rico, a former political prisoner, and Francisco Torres, we call him Cisco, uh, who is one of the San Francisco Eight, Vietnam veteran and activist. And I'm going to let Dilcia begin to tell us a little bit about herself and then go directly to Cisco. Perfect. Dilcia. Right. And my sister, Francisco. Well, I, if you don't know who I am, my name is Dilcia Pagan. I am one of the ex Puerto Rican political prisoners that served, I'm say it's an honor to have been able to serve my nation for 20 years in state and federal prisons. I was released September 10th, 1999. Um, I was a member of the FALN, which to me is an honor. I was charged, like all Puerto Ricans that fight for the freedom of our country with seditious conspiracy. And the reason I'm, I am in freedom for the past September 10th will be 12 years is it because of a national international campaign launched by our people, from religious leaders to all different groups of uh, different actors that believe in human rights. And Mr. Clinton had to sign our, our clemency with conditions. So that's me. I'm a former television producer, writer, artist, working on my book, hoping this year finish the documentary on the five Puerto Rican nationalist women. And I just became a grandmother on an incredible oh, day. Wonderful. El Grito de Lara, September 23rd is an incredible historical day. Right, George Jackson's against birthday. George Jackson's birthday was yes. the first insurrection of Puerto Ricans oh. against Spain. And after the assassination of Feliberto Gerajillos by the Why? FBI, I declared it. This whole has moving, yeah. We now this called El Grito de Lara against U.S. colonialism. All right, that yes. is a significant date. Isn't it? Yes. All right. Paula Sofia All is right. alive and well, and she's four months old. Yes. And Dilcia is visiting us uh, here in the Bay Area from Puerto Rico. And uh, how long will you be with us? Well, I'll be here till the 28th. All right. So it's and been wonderful. Yeah. I get to see you and all my comrades. Him, I see it mm -hmm. on and off. But it's what I, I was here four years ago, I think, right? Right. Yeah, we did an yeah, interview. Exactly. Yeah, we're so hoping it's, it'll get uploaded eventually. <laughs> we'll see. Yes, let's see what happens. <laughs> All right. Yes. And uh, Cisco, tell us about you. Well, I'm Francisco Torres. As she said, I'm 62. Uh, I'm one of the San Francisco Eight, the last remaining member of the San Francisco Eight. Uh, I still have a case against me. We were rounded up in January 23 of 2007. Uh, this was a case that came from the Justice Department uh, after the San Francisco Police Department didn't want it and it, it involved the killing of a police sergeant in, right here in San Francisco. Uh, so eight of us throughout the country were rounded up. Two brothers who were currently incarcerated in New York City, Herman Bell, Jalil Muntakim, uh, Harold Taylor from Panama City, Florida, Ray Boudreaux, Hank. Jones from LA uh, here in California, as well as Richard O'Neill and uh, uh, Richard, Richard Brown, Brown yeah. from San Francisco. Right. So, and I'm of course living in New York. I was born in Puerto Rico. And so we were rounded up and brought here for a trial since, uh, for, supposedly for a trial, in which they said they had all this massive evidence against us and we were going to do life in, life in prison. And since then, the charges against my co-defendants have been dropped and I'm the last remainder member who was offered a three-year probation in which I refused. Uh, right. And people always ask, why do you think that you were given a three-year probation? But that's because, uh, you know, we've always thought that they've tried to separate us. You know, I'm living in New York and most of the comrades are here in California. So I refused their deal and uh, we go to court on March the second, second mm -hmm. uh, before Next Judge Wednesday. Moscone Wednesday, right? Right. at 9 o'clock. Right, and we're going to have a rally at 8 a.m. and we want everyone Absolutely. to come out to that. So, yeah. And I know I would have stayed longer, but you know my spirit is there. Oh, I know that. For sure. sure. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> and uh, Dilcia, before we start uh, getting into uh, uh, the case and the politics, would you share with us that poem? Sure. Would you like to hear Yes, it? I would okay. love to. All right, this is a title piece called 10 Years in Freedom. Freedom comes from our souls. It's part of our essence. Freedom, libertad. At times we suffer from freedom and the end result is always beneficial. 
freedom, libertad. Once I arrived to Borinque in Puerto Rico, I felt freedom immediately in my heart because our people received me from all walks of life with heartfelt embraces. Freedom, libertad. One thing I have realized is that I have always been free, even while incarcerated, under the worst of conditions. Freedom, libertad. Personal freedom comes from within. When one is clear about one believes in, what one believes in, I believe in the freedom of my homeland, Puerto Rico. Freedom, libertad. People say that I have a way of being that is strong, yet tender. I try to allow my heart to always guide me. Freedom, libertad. I have walked the streets of San Juan, Juanica, Yauco, Ayuya, Ajuntas, La Maria. I've seen every day the need for freedom, libertad. Puerto Rico appears to be free. Our people smile and they dance, party, and share, yet our country is still not free. We remain a colony of the United States of America, never being able to have self-determination. Freedom, libertad. In 10 years, I have witnessed many beautiful awakenings, the victory of Yeques, the outburst of support for Comandante Felipeto Ojeda Rios after his assassination by the FBI, freedom. The streets were filled with children, elders, government workers, even the police saluted his funeral entourage. Freedom, libertad. As time passes, the victims are forgotten, reality sets in, nothing truly happens or has changed. Conditions of poverty, poor housing, miseducation, corruption prevails, but repression is alive and well. We continue forward, never losing our spirit to be free. Freedom, libertad. I reside in Loisa, where the Cimarrones live and the essence of our African roots are from. Young people there don't even know who Lolita Lebron or Adolfina Villabuena are. They have no knowledge of the struggles their ancestors have endured. Freedom, libertad. Bombas and plenas are heard on the streets every weekend. Once a year, everyone hits the streets to celebrate La Fiesta de Loisa. Freedom, libertad. I wish we could celebrate the beauty of Mother Africa every day. I wish we could show our children the beauty of freedom every day in the schools, the streets, the library, in our plazas. Freedom, libertad, a freedom that encompasses why they're so beautiful and alive, why their bodies move to unknown rhythms, why their skin is in shades of luscious chocolate, why the vigilantes should be called their heroes, why the vigilante should be called love, why every female should know that she is a casica, a chieftain of tribe, freedom, libertad. Freedom is something that comes from our souls. My soul tells me that our battle has not been won. We must make freedom a priority in our lives. Freedom, libertad. Yes, a freedom of spirit to change what surrounds us, a change that incorporates all of us, all of our being, mind, body, and soul without fears. Freedom, libertad. Everything we need to accomplish in life has a consequence. We live, we love, we work, we care. We fight for what is real and just with dignity and commitment. Freedom, libertad. Let us begin to walk the freedom walk with heads held high, committed to humanity, self-determination and self-love. Let us walk and fight for a free Puerto Rico. Freedom, Lolita vive, Feliberto vive, and the students of the University of Puerto Rico vive. Que viva Puerto Rico libre. Thank you. All right. Yes, and free Oscar. Free, free Oscar, Oscar and free Lopez. Avelino. And for all of our political Oscar prisoners. Lopez Rivera. Yes, I'm sorry. exactly. And right. Avelino Claudio Gonzalez. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Don't see that's beautiful. Thank you. And it's a wonderful um, segue into um, our freedom struggle for Cisco. Absolutely. Yeah. And, Cisco. Uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, I'd like to just say that. Can you even imagine this sixty-year-old veteran of the struggle who has given most of his life to struggling for change, uh, working with young people, uh, mentoring young people, um, and opposing war, working with the veterans, 
for Peace, is that right? right. Vietnam Veterans for Peace. And um, could you just imagine him being put back into jail at this point in his life? Uh, he has a family, has a wife, and and children, and adult children, young adult children, and going to jail for the rest of his life was something that an incident that happened in the, at the height of our struggle 40 years ago. I can't imagine. But the San Francisco has already spent a couple of million dollars trying to put these wonderful elders back into jail. Elaborate. Well, thank you for saying I'm 60. Every time when I talk to you, you always, she always says I'm either 58, 60, 62, I'm 52. Right? Two. I, I meant to say 62. No, exactly. I'm 71, so I got you by a few years. <laughs> well, no, thank you. Uh, look, one, of the, one of the things we always try to tell young people is that no matter what, but we always say the government, the Justice Department is always <clears throat> keeping tabs on us old activists. That's one of the things that they do with their counterintelligence programs. We call it COINTEL Pro. Counterintelligence will always be part of them. Then they always monitor us, people who are active and opposing their oppressive, their oppressive policies against the people. And as Dear Seal points out, we are fighting for libertad. We are fighting for freedom. Exactly. And when you're fighting for that, when you're opposing, we're always being monitored. So what happened in our case was back when Bush, the Bush administration, that is to say regime, was in power with Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Ashcroft, they spearheaded a program of surveillance. They started putting all kinds of surveillance exactly. uh, uh, laws into, uh, you know, uh, the power. Patriot Act. The Patriot Act, Homeland yeah, Security, security was created. And our case was one of the ones that they said when they launched the war against, you know, uh, Iraq, when they were starting to look for so-called weapons of mass destruction, which today we know there weren't any, uh, they said, look, they had this plan. We're going to round up old activists under the guise of cold cases. Our case was one of them. This case was a local case here in San Francisco at the time. The local DA did not want this case. You know, they said, we don't have any evidence. We yeah, don't Kamala want it. Kamala Harris was the DA at the time, yeah, and she oh, refused I, to I, take I, the yeah, case. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't want the case. Uh, what happened was the Justice Department, uh, the behest of that administration, which I mentioned, uh, Ashcroft being the attorney general at the time, you know, they funded a program. They, they, they came to then the attorney general of California, which was Jerry Brown, right. and said, here's funds, they give him funds under Homeland Security and everything, mm -hmm. and said, we need you to prosecute this case. So they were funded by the federal government. And so this case was launched against us. Originally, the federal government wanted this case. Now, understand this, that this was a local case, and yet the federal government wanted it. Right. They wanted a first to uh, uh, prosecute us, prosecute us under the RICO Act, the Racketeering Act, mm -hmm. exactly. and Conspiracy Act, right. which uh, you know, if anybody knows anything about it, it was created by a Yale professor for the purpose okay. of going after racketeers, exactly. and it's being used against activists. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So because it had a twenty-year a window, you know, they they couldn't prosecute us after twenty years under that act. They came back and financed then local enforcement, which is San Francisco. So once again, I want to remind you that this was not a federal case. This was state, a state, state case, case. Mm -hmm. and yet it was being funded by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And every time we ask in court, the DA, well, you say this is a local case and yet we want evidence and wiretap you know evidence uh, uh, about this case from the feds he says no we don't have any of that the feds are the feds we you know we don't have any of that ever we said well you were funded by the federal government you're right you were funded by the justice department therefore it's a federal case and you're prosecuting it so they told us that when we asked them in court well we know under COINTELPRO that 
the federal government has wiretaps of against course. the Panther Party. Of course. You know, and, uh, and all of us, and you know, who are active in the Panther today. Party it's and it's continuous. live today. Exactly. Well, I, I, you're looking at a, a person who was a plaintiff in a wiretap right. lawsuit that was settled out of court in New Haven. Right. So, so we know. So we know. So we said we want wiretap. And he right. said, no, we don't have any of that. The federal government that right. I know of, according to the right. DA, never had any of that. Mm. So. We've been fighting over you wanting that evidence. So right. on March the second, we're going to court because uh, uh, an inspector from San Francisco at the time who was supposedly working on this case, detected by the name of uh, Fickers, claimed that he knew that they were wiretap, you know, wiretaps in our case because he, he apparently told the FBI that he had evidence of certain people. You know, so he wanted wiretaps and that the FBI did wiretap, which contradicts the DA yeah, uh, saying that, you know, they didn't they didn't know of any wiretaps. So we want to put and him on the stand uh, because of Marilyn Buck. Buck, yeah, he met at the time when Marilyn yeah. had passed away. And this detective just that last says, year. Right. He this had made all these yeah. disparaging surfaced. remarks right. about her and this service. Right. right. And right. already and, they had denied any wiretaps. Right. Had, a, had existed, and then he comes out and he he blew it. Right, <laughs> right. So, and, so know, we have a guarantee that he'll be there on Tuesday. Well, we don't have a guarantee. We never know what they're going to do. But, but he's gonna... supposed to be looking forward to him being on the stand because it's part of our evidentiary hearing to put him on the stand, and exactly. he's been subpoenaed and required to come right. to court, and so. Anyway, that contradiction court. is going to be dealt with in court, in on, court on the second, and we will I be here in front of Judge Moscone on the second. How they uh, try to wriggle deal out with of that. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know Somebody's lying. Yeah, and course. it's not us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I heard that, but I have a question. Um, you say the fed feds were supposed to have sponsored this, right? Yes. Well, where did? Well, how is it that San Francisco? I wound up spending two million dollars. That's a good question. Now, and they're trying. They're now suing the state, trying to get it back out of the state, and and the state isn't even the sponsor. That's right. It, it's it, kind of. Well, don't forget that, that the federal, uh, under Homeland Security, right, the, 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 the Justice Department, right, is it's got control over all of this because now all the decisions are being made. You know, in the Justice Department, right? right? So they're telling local government what to do and how to use their funds, and you oh. know, they're controlling everything. Well, San you know, Francisco and, is putting the bill, and, and, they don't and, and in San Francisco, they didn't want it. And I presume that's why the last yeah, attorney general said, well, we, didn't want we, it. We don't have any evidence. We, it's yeah. Twenty of this. Why should we have to pay for it when we didn't? Even want to and and we didn't even case. want it because right. at the time they claimed that they had DNA evidence and they had swabbed us. And no DNA. They, have, they claim they had fingerprints. They claim they had they had. Uh, well, they claim they had the, a shotgun, which they never produced or said they got lost. They claim they had bullets that that was lost. They claim that they have a lighter with my fingerprints on it. Now this lighter was supposedly taken at the scene of the crime mm -hmm. at that time, and in <laughs> twenty and two thousand and three. They claimed that they finally found evidence that it was my fingerprints on it. Now, they've had this lighter all along. So we said, how did you now find out that it was my fingerprints? And they claimed the reason being that at the time they were looking at my fin my fingerprints through a right-handed perspective. And I said, what did they mean by a right-handed per perspective? Meaning that all along, all these experts from the San Francisco labs, forensic right. labs, and uh, FBI labs, and by the way, my fingerprints went to the Secret Service labs throughout the years, throughout all these years, 40 some odd, 30 some odd years there. They all looked at my fingerprints and said, they all thought I was a right hand though. So they just found out that I was left handed. Oh my goodness. See? And now they have this so called new technology right. that not, claims yeah. that there's my fingerprint. We said, what new technology? And they don't have any new technology other than other people looking at it and claiming that, oh, it is his fingerprints. <laughs> well, in our case, even though we were sentenced to 63 to the month, from 55 to 103 right. years, and this was 30 some odd years uh -huh. ago, they claimed that they had all of my comments that smoke, they had an ashtray from the safe house that must have been this big. 
And guess what? It had eight fingerprints, clear fingerprints. We laughed. I mean, said, you know, they never were able to prove any one of us were directly yeah. involved in any of the political military acts. And now they're saying it's, they kind of use the same strategy, yeah. thinking that maybe after 30 years you had a you had a, a lobotomy and now you don't remember things, you know? Right. They and I would just like to backpedal a little bit because I'm not sure if we made it clear what the incident was and put it in the context. Uh, it, it would, it, the incident, uh, the police officer was killed uh, on August 28th, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, in yes. 1971, and it was only about seven days, six days, after the assassination of George Lester Jackson, Soledad brother, in San Quentin, and uh, three uh, guards and two inmate turnkeys were killed that day as well. And so uh, we're talking about a period that was at the height of the of our freedom fight fighting struggle against the powers that be and COINTELPRO um, had managed to take out uh, and I mean murder um, at least 29 or 30 Panthers by then and um, there was really a war going on and it was a, a war of liberation and I'll let you two elaborate on our struggle for liberation because you are, were definitely in it. <laughs> I think for the Puerto Rican independence movement, we have fought against Spanish colonialism, U.S. colonialism. We represent the, uh, the struggle within the United States because that Puerto Rican nation, the, our island is 35 by 100 feet, miles, excuse me, feet, quite uh, embellished in hills and valleys. And because of the political colonialism, colonialization of our nation, our people have been forced to create the diaspora of the Puerto Rican nation in the United States. We have, There's always been arms. There's been a resistance since the time of Taino Indians. I always say they're the first scientists were the Tainos that took the Spaniards and they said that they were uh, immortal. And the Spaniards looked at them and they took the Taino cacique, the cacique, the conquistador, and they threw him in the river and I said, well, if he's immortal for three days, the sucker dying. And that was when the first time the Puerto Rican Taino Indians and the black slaves that had already been brought in to Puerto Rico became the first guerrilla, which was called the Cimarrones. So that we have a history of, of freedom fighters um, since we were invaded by Spain. And today, we talk, you talked about Oscar Lopez. I don't know if people understand. Oscar is my co-defendant. He's not really my co he, Oscar was arrested two years after myself. There are two groupings of Puerto Ricans arrested in Illinois in 1980. Oscar is, has already served 30 years. In January, he went to the parole board. When we were given our clemency, Oscar was offered clemency like us, but he had to do five more years. And Oscar refused to sign. The government claimed that there was a, he had planned his escape, and they claim again to have evidence which they never showed. Anyway. Oscar remained inside. We were out, 11 of us, no, we, nine of us were released. He went to the parole board in January, and how they escorted Oscar Lopez Rivera, a 60-year-old artist, revolutionary brother, because he'll always be who he is. They had shackles, had a black box on him. A black box is a little black box that they put on your cuffs, and whenever we were moved, we were moved with chains around our bodies, shackles, and the black box. They were moving him from within the institution to the parole hearing. Our attorneys came. Jan was there. They did not allow the former president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association to be participating in the hearings. But guess what? They had three witnesses of the CIA, supposedly a member of the family who I happen to know who he is because I had a press conference many years ago here when William escaped of the family that supposedly that he's the son of someone that died in the Francis Tavern political military act. And none of us, and, and let me go back, let's go to Oscar because that's who I'm referring to. None of Oscar's charges have nothing to do with Francis Tavern. So the government felt that they brought the so-called witness, he's the son of the person that died, and they want to, they created this, this scene where, you know, Oscar is the leader of the FAM, the head terrorist, 
and his appearance before the parole board, he went in there with over 4,000 letters. He had the support of the elected officials. The resident commissioner in Washington of the Statehood Governor's Party supported his release. The Association of Governors of Puerto Rico supported his release. Congressman Nidia Velasquez, Serrano, and Gutierrez supported his release. Didn't Desmond too, too, also? Desmond, well, Desmond supported our release. Oh, okay. Um, there were some international supporters. We mm -hmm. have Jose Rivera, the assemblyman from New York. Mm -hmm. Thousands of, all sectors of our Puerto Rican society, be it in the diaspora or in Puerto Rico, supported Oscar. And they told him, you have to come back in 15 years. Let me ask you just one question. He was never indicted for Francis Tyrone, accused of it. All no. of a sudden, this Which pops up when he gets ready to come Arnold. out. Yeah. In 1970, I would think, I think it's 74. I'm not, maybe I'm mistaken, I forget the date. Francis Tyrone in New York City is down by the court area with the hopeless hangout. And it is a restaurant where all the big time executives have lunch, where the wheeling and dealing takes place. Let's be real. That's what, that's how. Corporate America. That's how the corporate America entity makes all their decisions. And in Puerto Rico at that time, Cohen Tupelo was alive and well. We had a restaurant in Puerto Rico where the FBI or the CIA, whatever we want to call them, planted a bomb and it killed three of the compañeros, no leaders in the Puerto Rican independence movement, were severely injured and their nine year old daughter was killed. When Frost's Talent came out in the press, the organization that took responsibility was the FALN. I remember the communique said and this was in retaliation. FALN too. The FALN was the armed urban guerrilla group operating, doing political military acts for the independence of Puerto Rico in the United States. What does the acronym translate? Absolutely. FALN stands, and it's a direct translation, Armed Forces for National Liberation. In Puerto Rico at the time, that time they had five groups. Then they split, now we, there was the main group, was the Macheteros, which is Feliberto Gerajillos, right. but right. I mentioned before, was assassinated by the FBI five years ago, after 23 right. years in clandestinity. So that Oscar, because he's been in prison 30 years, they bring this old case. But they had nothing to yeah, do yeah, with him. But, but we, we kind of got sidetracked a little bit back to the New mm -hmm. York City Tavern. What happened to that one? There was an explosion and several an explosion executives and died. And executives died. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was an retaliative act for what had occurred in Puerto right. Rico. But and Oscar had nothing to do with that. Yeah. Oscar right. had nothing to do. I had nothing to do. William Morales had nothing to do. They have never been able to prove even any, during our right. case, or and ask none of us, that any of the political military acts were done individually by any one of us. That it never it worked. Never, never worked. Good. And here's Oscar. You know, he's been involved in uh, working and doing his artwork in prison. Well, you know, I, I just have so, to say this. Well, the final may I finish the final decision. Sure. We did a, another campaign. We faxed the parole board, the parole commission. Again, thousands upon know, thousands. I was exactly. And I call I remember the woman that actually didn't know what she was doing. I mean I said well, she must be special at what I call those people that don't government employees that maybe didn't get a GED. And I'm being catty, but it's the truth. We just got the word on the uh, two days about a week before I left to I here. I'm aware of that. Oscar now has to serve 15 Another additional degree. years. But that's exactly what they've been doing. And um, is, is basically California has um, instituted what um, is tantamount to a resentencing uh, law by the parole boards. Because uh, they're giving now, they're able, and you, the limit used to be five years. Come back to in two to three to five years. Now it's five to 15 years. Is this so a state? Don't in the state. Like, in California. This is a, yeah, but this is a federal. You're, yeah, um, but I mean, that's the new deal. That's what's happening, and it may be spreading to other states and other and mm -hmm. jurisdictions, and certainly the feds, obviously, but 
that's what they're doing now. They're, they're re, uh, Sundiato Coley just got another 10 uh, after 37 years. So what they're doing now is they're basically giving out new sentences. I mean, 15 years is a new sentence. For Absolutely. Sentence. So, so our political prisoners, no. he's already been in there close to 30 years, 30 right? 30 years. 30 years. And so now he's, he's been given not parole, but a new sentence. Exactly. So uh, this is just outrageous. Well, one of the things that's happening is that see, when we get incarcerated at, at, at political prisoners, you know, when we were, because we are political prisoners and we're in because of our political Absolutely. conviction and political yes. action, no question about it. That's why we're looked upon, especially by the government and the Justice Department and the administrations, anybody who else who comes into power here in America. And the reason being, whether, whether we're out in the street uh, protest and doing active work, political work, there's that surveillance on us, phone taps. If we're arrested, we're not just put in uh, population, we're put in segregation. But no. we used to be put in segregation. Now they have what they call these administrative wings, special administrative wings. And when administrative wings within jails and prisons have failed to quiet us because we do still do work amongst people in prison and, and, and the incarcerated and our supporters raising awareness then they started creating these supermaxes oh, these yes. special administrative prisons yeah. to not just isolate us from other right. prisoners like, and family but if it's perfect is that way to it was formerly well, known as rap brown yeah, and others in florence. If florence and well we're talking about florence colorado places that but basically are even unreachable to lawyers because when lawyers even go out there they, they have to go that, into no denver access. colorado and no access and then they have to take some type of uh they have to be searched you and know they have to i mean and their Always. notes yeah, have to be looked at as well and oh, yeah, yeah well, i yeah, think so, people need to know, know understand that. that this isn't, hasn't started i was released in 99 yeah. and prior to why i released the bop which is the yeah. bureau of prisons set up a precedence of the new structure of all facilities. All federal prisons are to have a holding place, which is pre-sentence. A camp, but supposedly when you're good, a good prisoner, which none of us have ever put in a camp, a maximum security, and a control unit. And let us not be deceived. That's been happening since before 1999. Oh, yeah. You know, our comrade Avelino oh, yeah. Gonzalez Claudio was 23 years in clandestinity. He was arrested eight months ago, right? two years, I'm sorry, three years ago. This is the first time he is now in general population. The brother has um, Parkinson's disease. He has been denied medical treatment. And how did he get to his new location? They put him what they call a robin round. The man has not been in general population in three years and sick. We had to demand his lawyers, like you said, were not allowed to visit him. For the first time, he's in general population. Yeah. Talked to his wife before leaving. She's going next weekend to see him. But the lawyers haven't been able to visit him. First, he now is getting his medication. That's why, because he is a political prisoner. And people have to be very clear. And people forget. Our movement forgets. Our people forget that we have comrades like Oscar... Sundiata Coley, mm -hmm. that have been inside 30 and almost 40 years, oh, yeah. and we forget. Let us not get deceived because we have a black president, you know? Oh, yeah. Our people are dying inside prisons, and we need to activate yeah. that movement I we call have. him the great pacifier. He's put this movement asleep for a that couple of years. Change has, his change is not about us. It's about, no, no, you know, he's, he's their boy. Yeah. He's their boy. But I think it's important because I think our people get... We get lost in this fantasy world, exactly, and we don't know the reality yes. because the media doesn't put out the real reality that our people are suffering, not right. only in the community, but inside the prison jails. Right. I have a feeling that uh, we're probably running out of time, so I want to give uh, both of you an opportunity for some last words before we tie it up. All right. But I think it's important. That I think that this, to me, this, our young people are the future. In Puerto Rico, we have our students that taken over the University of Puerto Rico, the governor of Puerto Rico, who's a state or he wants Puerto Rico to become a state. He just, uh, two days ago, he fired the board of directors of the most independent union of teachers, so 36 
Members of the board of that union, Federation of Teachers, union were fired. Union busting in Puerto Rico, exactly. just like in Wisconsin. Exactly. Oh so boy. this is uh, rise Governor up, Fortuna. Folks. folks need to rise up. And rise up, up means Tuesday. You got to be at the courthouse. Support the brother. No, next Wednesday. Is it next Wednesday? Wednesday? Next Wednesday. 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 I'm sorry. Wednesday. It's important. We have to come out and support our people because let us not forget, yes, we do count. We've learned from Egypt. Look what happened. Now we have to guarantee that Egypt becomes yeah. a real... That's right. A real democracy of the people. That's but we right. have the power right now to yes, create our own collective unity amongst all people of color. Via Puerto Rico Libre, all power to the people. Right. And uh, this year was correct when she said, you know what, she talked about freedom and in her poem and libertad because that's what we're fighting for. Freedom, libertad. And people say, well, today you're free here in America. I say no, we say no. Puerto, Puerto Rico, of course, is a colony, as, as, as well, we know, as Samoa and other countries, you know, are colonies. So how can we, you know, you can't tell me as a colonialized subject. I was born into colonialism, so don't tell me I was free. It wasn't by, you choice. know, by <laughs> choice. We were given, we were taken. We were given by Spain and taken by the U.S. How did that work out? We don't know because as colonial subjects, we're neither here nor there. As a black Puerto Rican, you know, and, you know, being here in America, you know, I fought for the liberation, you know, here because this is what I am this is I identify in America this is how I am this is who I am and that's what I've always been fighting for and you cannot tell me that we are free as a Vietnam veteran I was a blinded soldier just like a lot of young men and I never forgot I was out there in the field in Vietnam and in combat situation I once asked myself what are you doing here what are you doing here like young man ready to die you know ready to kill somebody else you know what are you doing here and i said to myself well when you get back you have to do something you have to fight for your people you have your eyes open now and come what may you are ready to die here for somebody that you don't know somebody who had a foot on your neck still has a foot on your neck and people and you have to go out there and do all you can for your people so I came back to America, <laughs> stateside, and uh, I started organizing soldiers and I met members of the Black Panther Party who uh, gave me materials and uh, said, brother, the struggle is here. And <laughs> that's that. what, that's it. and the struggle was all over. And uh, right. I never made it back to New York. I stayed in Denver and I did work there. And, all power to the and people. The and the rest is history. history. That's it, <laughs> All power to the people. That's well, right. thank you so much, Dilcia Pagana. It's right. wonderful having you here as a guest in the Bay Area. It's just, uh -huh. I hope you can come back soon. Absolutely. And I wish you all the best in Puerto Rico. And I hope Puerto Rico will be free soon. Hopefully, and that's I hope, it. Uh, I hope that Cisco oh, will you. be free Absolutely. of all of the pressure of this uh, case hanging over his head all these years. Uh, thank you so much oh, for being my guest me. here, our guest. I want to thank the Angola 3 News for filming this. And um, I'm Kilu Nyasha, and I'd just like to say that I'm very glad to still be alive to see um, the spread of revolution throughout North, North Africa, spreading to the Middle East and spreading back here to the U.S. via Wisconsin and in Ohio and hopefully it'll spread all over the globe because we need a global revolution. It is global. And uh, so all power to the people, uh, free all political prisoners, vencedemos. <laughs>